Okay, hello everyone. Good evening. Oh, good evening. Uh -huh, thank you. Yes, to begin with, I think that it is fair and proper that we invite God to steer the affairs of this uh, all important event. So, without much ado, please help me in welcoming our very own Dr. Ofusu uh, Bakon to give us the opening prayer. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Thank you very much. Good evening, colleagues. I will try to push something down your throat. In my travels, I learned that religion is one of the things that separates us, other than politics and sex. So what I've done in my travels is that I ask everyone to pray to his or her deity. So I invite people to respectfully stand up bow your head and let's maintain a moment of silence and have everyone pray to his deity. So shall we all pray? Father God, we ask for the success of this evening activity and for the prosperity of Pescova. This we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, thank you. Please be upstanding. Be upstanding. Be upstanding. I'm sorry. Um, we just want to observe a minute silence for our fallen heroes. So let's, let's remember them. A minute of silence, please.
And now may the soul of the faithful departed through the mercies of God rest in peace. Amen. Please take your seat. Once more, I will invite all of us. Um, I know we just took our seats, but we will have to stand again for the school's anthem. And so please, let's all be upstanding as we sing the, the school's anthem. exciting to have them begin to understand that St. Peter's, the creation of St. Peter's took some bold vision of some of our fathers who have gone to create the school. And today there is meaning for us in terms of how we comport and how we live um, the values. So at this point, I want to say greetings to the headmaster, Mr. Osu Adiomi, wherever you are. 
and uh, the capable leadership of the school, we are happy to have you participating during today's event. For us at, at uh, Pescoba, the Founders Day allows us to recommit to the ideals of our school as we seek to be better leaders in our community and support the school, our alma mater. To start, I wish to extend the sincere apologies of our president, Mr. Benafrifa, for physically not being here today. We know that he has us in our thoughts and we also pray for a quick recovery for him. I want to thank with us today. We are happy to welcome those joining us for the first time and uh, across the world. Um, right now, um, we St. Peter's can be found everywhere. And it's a pleasure to be engaging with you wherever you are. Today, we are having the fifth Founders Day. And today, we are having a memorable, a memorable Founders Day as we have students at the school joining us for the first time. Even as we have all had to make changes in our lives to adjust to COVID, this Founders Day has gone through a lot of challenges. Originally, we hoped to have had it on campus at the school, but COVID and its impact and uncertainties have meant that we've had to reschedule it on a couple of occasions. But be that as it may, we are here and we will have a successful one. Our hope is that this Founders Day and going forward will act as a pilgrimage for us, Pescuba, to go back to the school and recommit to the ideals of our founding fathers whose sacrifices have benefited us in our careers after school. Our desire is to make Pescuba 30 years after school to be the organizers of Founders Day. So today we are grateful to the 89-91 year group, 30 years after school, for sponsoring dinner for the students on campus and for nominating a chairperson for the program. We want, we want some of our major events to be led by specific year groups who after a certain number of years after school have actually demonstrated themselves and are ready to champion the vision of St. Peter. So today is a milestone for 89-91 year group. I do wish to express my appreciation to all Pescoba for the support the executives have received and continue to receive. Without the strong and ongoing support by many year groups to pay dues and invest in school projects, many of the things that are being done on campus would not have been done. Here, I wish to mention the names of a few people and year groups for their significant support in 2021. I would like to mention Dr. James Lindsay, who has committed to complete a new headmaster's bungalow. This is what we call a legacy project because it will continue to endure and benefit the school for years to come. The 79, 81 year group have also committed to put up an infirmary, which is very important for the school. We also have, we also have contributions from 2004, 882, 93, 95, 97 year groups, and not forgetting Mr. Siedu Sechre for providing furniture for the secretariat that we seek to establish for Pescoba here in Accra. <clears throat> Honestly, we will not be able to mention all names here, but we want to say we are very grateful and commend you all for making the interest of the school your concern. We are also grateful to all members for the contributions in payment of dues and supporting your year group leaderships in their activities. 
at this juncture, I would again want to acknowledge our headmaster and the teachers at the school. Their work to support the association and to build the school in diverse ways have been recommendable. Your effort to make St. Peter's or PESCO a first class and enviable school in Ghana is recognized. We also acknowledge the invaluable contribution of SVD in terms of the creation of the school and your contributions in terms of our funding fathers to which have led to the school that we have today. Today we are here to listen to a talk in pursuit of dignitati hominium and the imperatives of public service, integrity and accountability. It's a timely reminder to us all, since as a country, matters of corruption and its consequences continue to be a daily battle in our lives. Our able speaker, who will be introduced in due time, is an authority on the subject. So once again, let me extend a warm welcome to each and every one of you joining us across the world. We are indeed honored with your presence. If you have questions and suggestions, note them in the chat box. For those present, at the appropriate, the appropriate time, time, you will be given the opportunity to ask your question. Our chairman for today's event is none other than Peskuba Yao Ejei Ejepon of the 8991-year group. Our chairman was appointed the CEO of, of Oboma Farm Products Limited in May 2013, having served as a board member since 2009, and a key member of the team involved in restructuring the farm in these difficult days. He's a key member of the Oil Palm Development Association of Ghana, and presently the first vice president and Eastern Zona chairman of the association. Yao is a banker with over 14 years banking experience. He has also extensively um, gotten experience in various industries, as he worked in banks and he worked in the corporate environment and now managing a business. He holds a degree in geography and research development from the University of Ghana and a master's degree in international affairs from the University of Ghana and has completed the seed transformation program from Stanford University. Yao believes in giving back and influencing society positively. In his previous life, he served as a secretary of this association. He is married with three children. Let us, with a round of applause, welcome our chairman for today, Peskoba Yao Ejei Ejepon, to the stage for his remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, our Vice President, for your kind introduction. Good evening again, Pescuba here, and those watching via Facebook. Good evening to the headmaster and the students who are for the first time joining us online. I think this is very laudable. However, I spoke to my son who is in final year on my way here and he have a clue of what was happening. Maybe because he's busily um, trying to pre prepare for his exams. Um, I also say thank you to my year group for asking me to um, be here to chair this occasion and then to the global executives for accepting me to chair this function. I had, um, I was hesitating um, when I was told, but I have too much PESCO DNA in me that I couldn't say no. Um, 
the Founders Day lecture is part of the activities that um, annual activities um, enshrined in our constitution, which is designed to bring Pescoba fraternity together and also to showcase Pescoba. And this is a prime example of how we showcase what the school has done for us. Um, my congratulations to the national executives again for being able to organize this in these times. Um, COVID-19 is virtually changing our world. Um, and for you to be able to do this um, in, in this time, it's, it's, it's laudable. So congratulations. Um, I'm from Nkwetia, so we, we are no longer. Um, the theme, in pursuit of dignitati hominum and the imperatives of public service, integrity and accountability. Now, first of all, the Dabena Mote Professor, this is very loaded. Um, however, integrity and accountability has, in the public service, it's an age-old discussion. Um, it has been relevant ever since we became um, an independent country, and it's still relevant. Um, the roots of um, corruption in public service may well be the lack of um, integrity and accountability. But I am a farmer, and what do farmers know about integrity and accountability and public service? So we have today in our midst a worthy son of Pescuba who, has, who is spending his life thinking, talking, and teaching about accountability and integrity in public service. So, without much ado, let me introduce our speaker for this occasion. I was told that he will not be happy um, if I mention his um, nickname, but since the Vice President has given us the leeway, um, I will. A.K.A. Shui. Dr. Kojo Pumpuni Asante was appointed Director of Advocacy and Policy Engagement at the Democratic Center for um, the Ghana Center for Democratic Development a leading African democracy and government policy research think tank on Friday, uh, on February 2018. He was previously senior research fellow and also once served as head of research and programs at CDD Ghana. A legal policy and governance specialist, Dr. Santos' diverse range of policy research interest and experience includes anti-corruption, social accountability, local government, human rights, natural resource governance, and the politics of development. Shue holds a PhD in development policy and management from the University of Manchester, UK. A Master of Arts degree in African Studies from the State University of New York, Albany. A barrister at law degree from the Inns of Court, School of Law, UK, and a law degree from the University of Buckingham, UK. He is a researcher. He was a researcher at the Effective States and Inclusive Development Center at the University of Manchester, and a Hewlett Fellow at the um, Weatherhead Center for International Affairs, Harvard University. He has also consulted for the Overseas Development Institute and Adam Smith International. Dr. Pumpuni Asante is a champion of youth courses, a member of the Young Leaders Network of the Partnership with Africa project of President Horst Kohler, former president of Germany, and an alumni of the Young African Leaders Forum initiated by the U.S. President Barack Obama in 2010. He also volunteers and provides other free professional services for Youth Bridge Foundation, a youth targeted NGO preaching in Ghana and other countries in Africa, 
and serves as Honorary Chair, Executive Vice Chair of Intiamwa Foundation, a Ghanaian-funded charity that provides financial assistance for education and health needs of poor and other marginalized persons in certain rural areas in Ghana. A trained barrister, Dr. Sante is a member of the Ghana Bar Association, the Bar of England and Wales, and the Honorable Society of Grace in England. Fellow Pescoba, your speaker for this evening, Dr. Asante Pumpuni. And uh, let me say uh, good evening to the Vice Chair. Um, the Global President, I understand, is not here. And for your executives, uh, good evening as well. To all the, the headmaster and staff and students gathered uh, in St. Peter's this evening, I say good evening to you too and all our guests, all those participating virtually today. I don't know what the students are eating these days uh, during the evening, but I'm hoping that uh, they stay awake. I think we used to watch only movies. <laughs> so this might be a new experience for them. Um, let me thank you um, for doing me this honor, uh, inviting me to be speaker at this year's Founders Day lecture. Now, I'm particularly excited at the first ever virtual Founders Day lecture. I'm a history buff, so maybe I might go down in history as the first ever speaker <laughs> for the Founders Day lecture, the virtual one. Um, but in these current realities of pandemics and the ever-changing technological space, I am sure that this will not be the only virtual Founders Day. We are likely to have more of those. Uh, as the years go by. Today, I am speaking on the topic in pursuit of dignitati hominum and the imperatives of public service integrity and accountability. And I'm sure you are wondering <laughs> what this is all about. I have been in the NGO sector promoting democracy, good governance, and inclusive development for 16 years. The public service and the state in general are the areas in which I have spent the most time agonizing. Now, I organize over it because I understand from my social science training and the development work experience that no matter how we desire to become like the Asian Tigers, the Singapores, the South Koreas, the Taiwans, or the Nordic countries, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, or even a Ghana beyond aid, we will not be able to achieve that development without a well-functioning, effective, transparent, and accountable public service. A service that is staffed with men and women of integrity and competence who possess the passion to serve the public cause. So in essence, as Pescoba and as citizens, if we are to fulfill our call to duty to uphold the dignity of mankind, we have to uphold the integrity of the public service. In the next 30 minutes, I will remind you of our call to duty but look, by looking at the foundations that our forebears built for us. Then I will paint a very troubling picture of the development challenges that confront the Ghanaian state and how that impedes our charge to uphold and defend the dignity of mankind. Third, I will talk about the imperatives of public service, why we must care about the public service and the state generally, but also the, the imperatives of integrity in public life 
and public accountability. Fourth, I would like to share with you a scorecard of where we are in terms of the state of our public service, integrity and public accountability. And lastly, just to conclude on what we can do to change the course if we are to hold firm to the St. Peter's Church and hopefully one day achieve our dream. And I hope you stay with me. It might be a little long <laughs> journey. But since you are here, uh, let's make the best out of it. The story is told of an Accra Bay citizen of Inquetiakwe uh, called Openin Owunafache, who wanted the Catholic Church to establish a school in Inquetia. Mr. Fachi approached Reverend Father Kletos Hadap, SVD, and SVD, for those who might not know, is the Society of the Divine Word, a Roman Catholic missionary, one of the groups there, to discuss this idea. And then he then went to Right Reverend Joseph Bowers, who was the Bishop of Accra, to also discuss with him. It is recorded that on the 7th of January 1957, Bishop Bowers met with Nkweti Ahini, Nana Sante Yadom, and his elders, and agreed to start St. Peter's Secondary School, now Senior High School. The Nkweti Ahini and his people donated a large tract of land, half a mile square, that's over 300 acres, and also agreed to offer communal labor for the building of the school. The school was named after St. Peter Clava, a Spanish Jesuit priest who worked most of his life among the slaves of Colombia. St. Peter's opened his doors for business on the 5th of February 1957, just a few days before independence, with 36 founding students and two teachers in the private home of the late Openin Fachi. Then in September 1960, St. Peter's was officially approved by the Ministry of Education as a secondary school. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the narrative of St. Peter's is one of vision, selflessness, dedication, perseverance, but most importantly, public service. Putting the interests of others before your own. That is the foundation of St. Peter's from Mr. Fachi who dreamt about building a secondary school to educate young boys and agreeing to use his private residence to start the school. The missionaries, Father Hadap and his brothers who embraced the idea and got Bishop Bowers to support it. The Inkweti Ahini, Nana Santu Yadom and his elders who gave their land. The people of Inkweti who contributed their labor to build the school. All put their welfare of the many people above themselves. Our foundations were built on service to mankind and is encapsulated in our motto, Dignitati Hominum, the dignity of mankind. It is therefore not surprising that our school anthem reinforces the call to action. And permit me to read it. Youth of St. Peter's, our standard is raised from east, north, west, and south. True dignity of our human race, the school's maxim, the school's motto must resound. Dignitati hominum, true to dignity of man in all the world. It goes on, clad all of us, God, with the armor of truth. And I believe that comes from Ephesians. Get us with the love for our neighboring men. Steal us with virtue that governs our path. Clothe our hands with the honor of men. Our call to action is to serve our fellow citizens, our fellow Pescoba. And we must seek the truth love for our fellow human beings and be virtuous, which is to exhibit high moral standards and to act honorably. These are the values that will help us fulfill our charge as Pescoba. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, now that we know our charge, what are some of the issues of the indignity of mankind that we must confront in this Ghanaian state of ours? Ghana will celebrate 30 years of the 1992 constitution next year. Over the last 30 years, we have made some significant improvements in our socioeconomic life. Over, two, over a two-decade period between 1991 and 2012, Ghana cut by half the number of people who are classified as poor from 51%, 51.6% to 21.4%. Extreme poverty also declined, dropping from 37 0.6% in 1991 to 9.6% in 2003. Now this was backed by a steady growth rate of 4% or 5% in the 1990s and about 8% from 2000 onwards. We have improved access to basic and recently secondary school education with a free SHS policy. Additionally, we are one of the few countries in the world to introduce universal health care with the establishment of the national health insurance. So there have been improvement also in water, and we must acknowledge our political stability and democracy in spite of all its faults, making the Fourth Republic the longest surviving republic since independence. Now, while I do not take any of these achievements for granted, we still face significant challenges, and in some cases, we have actually retrogressed. According to the Ghana Statistical Service Poverty Profile Report, published in June 2020, and this is based on the Ghana Living Standards Survey, for those uh, who know about the uh, report that is done every five years. Our economic growth basically has not been pro poor. It has been far from it. Now, the incidence of poverty declined marginally by 0.8%. That's less than 1% from 24.2 to 23.4. And this, this is the absolute number of Ghanaians who are poor or categorized as poor is 6.8 million. Extreme poverty declined by 0.2% from 8.4% to 8.2% in the same period. Now, in absolute, in absolute terms, we actually added 200,000 to that number. 200,000 Ghanaians became or fell into the extreme poor category. And when I say extreme poor, we mean uh, those of us who are uh, earning $1.90 per day, which is, I think, in today's uh, exchange rate, maybe 14 CDs or something like that. All right. Now, if you compare what the Ghana Living Standard Survey is, is, is saying, for round seven, which was conducted between 2016 and 2017. And you compare that to the previous five years, we had reduced the incidence of poverty by 7.7%. And then, as I've said, in the last two decades, we actually halved it. And when you even read further, you realize that the incidence of poverty is also spatial. So it's worse in the northern regions of Ghana, in the Volta region, in some parts of the western region and the story is not different when you start to think about the inequality gap and i don't want to get into the gini coefficients and so on and so forth but the the story is that inequality between the rich and poor is also widening and there's an osfam blog that really capt uh, captures the problem in a very good example it states that 2% of the wealthiest 10% of Ghanaians now share 32% of Ghana's total consumption. That's 2% of the wealthiest 10% share 32% of total consumption. It doesn't mean that they are eating most meat than everybody else. But in terms when you put a value on what is consumed totally by Ghana, it's only 2% of that 10% that's consuming that. 
Now, what they are consuming is more than the bottom 60% of the population combined. All right. And the very poorest 10% of the population consumes only 2% of our total consumption. So the paradox, the paradox of poverty and the inequality story is that this poverty story and its outcomes occurred during a very stable period of growth, aided by Ghana becoming an oil-producing country. So when you look at our annual growth rate from 2005 to 2017, we were growing at an average of 6.8%, the lowest being 3.7% and a high of 14%. So the contradiction is that when Ghana was getting richer, the people were getting poorer. And that's the paradox. We are talking about millions of citizens not a being able to consume basic necessities. And we're not just talking about food, but it's shelter, clothing, health, cooking fuel, water. I don't know how much a ball of kinky costs these days. But if you are holding 14 cities a day, and you have to use the same to cater for all your basic needs, you can understand what we are talking about. Now let's look at another challenge that creates the indignity of mankind. Youth unemployment. Of course, this is important to our younger brothers and our sons who are still in school, as well as the many who have graduated but are unemployed. There was a period in my life when even after I was called to the bar in the UK, I could not find a job. And the frustration was unbearable having to sit every day trying sending letters going out knocking on doors and not finding anything so i know what it means to be unemployed current statistics show that about a third of our population are between the ages of 18 and 35 and about 60 percent are below 35. we just concluded the election the electoral commission tells us that 55% of registered voters were between the ages of 18 and 35. It's a clear indication that the youth are in the majority, even if you use the UN definition of youth, which is 18 to 25. The Ghana Living Standards Survey Round 7 defined unemployed, an unemployed person as 15 years or older who is within the reference period and was not engage in any work, had no attachment to a job or business, and was potentially available for a job. Now, based on that, they estimated that the unemployment, the number of people who were unemployed was over a million, slightly over a million. That's 15 years and older. Now, for our purposes, the biggest challenge is that as much as 74% of that number are between the ages of 15 and 34 years. Now, the, the report further reveals that even with those who are employed, they are employed in vulnerable employment. That is 66.2% of all those who are unemployed are in vulnerable employment. And they are also largely in the informal sector, which is 71.3%. And it goes on to say, that the likelihood of employment is highest between the ages of 35 to 30, 39 years and lowest at the ages of 15 and 19 years. Certainly, uh, 15 and 19 years is the school period, so you have to take that into account. However, our population is youthful, and therefore, if you have to wait till 35 years to get a decent job, then you can understand the scale of the problem we have. For our younger brothers at school now, who are listening to us, who are watching us, I share these statistics not to scare you or for you to give up. It is for you to know the size of the challenge that confronts us. That in essence, this is the time to double our efforts and be aggressive and to dedicate ourselves to our call to action. 
So if you are feeling lazy at school, you don't want to go for prep, you are feeling lazy, you don't want to stay up and learn, I'm telling you that it is hard out there. So you have to double your steps. You have to recommit yourself to the course. I have two other short issues that I want to raise just to give us a scale of the problem. I want to highlight as part of um, the issues I want us to confront the issue of teenage pregnancy. A recent Joy News report brought to the public attention the situation of children in Wild West District, where close to 700 teenage girls had become pregnant during the COVID-19 period. They have gone further to share national statistics widely in the public and in social media, which states that between 2006, I think it's 2016 and 2020, 555,000 teenage pregnancies were recorded. That's the majority of them between, uh, 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 involving girls between the ages of 15 and 19. However, as many as 13,444 cases were involved girls between the ages of 10 and 14 years. How, How many, many lives, lives have, have been, been ruined, ruined by, by this? this? How many scientists, how many engineers are going to have their lives disrupted? What is going to happen to the children that are giving birth to? A complete blot on our conscience and one that we have to confront. And lastly, and I'm sure you are all aware of the speed of road crashes occurring on our road. And the numbers are frightening. These days, you have to think about actually taking a trip on a long distance. Between January and July 2021, 9,520 motor crashes were recorded, involving 16,226 vehicles. 1,709 human beings died. That's more than the total number of coronavirus-related deaths. Then as many as 9,299 people have been injured. So one can imagine how many families across the country will lose their limbs, suffer mental disorders, lose their livelihood. So brothers... Youth of St. Peter's, I paint this picture to let you know that we have work to do and we do not have time. We need to answer the call. I have shown you that our alma mater was born out of selfless sacrifice to benefit mankind. And therefore, we have a charge to promote and protect the dignity of mankind. In that contest... We have to pay attention to the many challenges that confront and create the indignities. The question then is, what is the vehicle for pursuing the goal? Here, I argue that the public service and the state in general, integrity and accountability is the precondition for fulfilling that goal. The obvious truth is that when we are born, we do not get to choose who we should commune with and which societies best fit our evolving values and aspirations of life. I think if God was to give us a choice, uh, I don't know how many people would choose Ghana. Because there are definitely competing countries that we wouldn't mind you know, being. However, once we are geographically located, we begin a journey of conformity and struggle with societal norms. Now, in spite of this unending struggle in our communities, there is one clear reality. Wherever we live and commune, in whichever part of the world, particularly in today's modern society, 
we have to rely on others to be able to access quality basic services. Why? Many of us cannot afford to construct our own highways, airports, specialist hospitals, universities, or even provide safe drinking water. The reality is that as members of society, we need to pool our resources together to finance these basic public goods organized through a system of government. If indeed we could privately finance these amenities, we may not need governments. So for me, the concept of public service is a noble one. If we believe that we are all rational human beings, that we think primarily about ourselves and not others, then when an individual in a society chooses to first deny his own private interest and to serve others, often with limited material rewards compared to the private sector, that sacrifice is worth celebrating but also supporting. The latter is critical because without public service, societies cannot function and life would indeed be terrible. Imagine if the earliest humans had privatized water and security, health and education, and this system has remained throughout history. How miserable would life have been if you were born today into a family that had no ownership rights to these basic survival goods. It is more likely that you would have ended up born into servitude to pay for the services that you will get once you get here on earth. So implicit in the idea of public service is the value of integrity and accountability. To serve others is to deny yourself. To serve others is to deny yourself. One can stay true to that if they act with integrity, truth, and honor, as our anthem says. Now, German scientist Max Weber developed a theory of bureaucracy that has informed organizations um, in the public sector for many decades, and I'm sure the chairman probably knows more about it than I do. One principle that he articulated that resonates with me is the principle of impersonality. He articulated it in the respect of applying laws within an organization. But for me, it goes to the philosophical underpinnings of a public service. That you do not use the power or authority granted to you for yourself, but for the organization and the clients of that organization. In this regard, the public. Now, that requires a commitment, a set of values with integrity at the core. So, I'm saying that public service is a noble cause. If you were a pastor, I would say it would be a calling. And that's the ideal. And there is an inherent set of values that must accompany anybody who wants to be able to serve the public. Lastly, public accountability. Now, public accountability is equally expected in this Weberian organization that I talk about. But for public institutions in a democracy, it is the duty. It is a duty that must be discharged. Why? Because sovereignty lies in the people in a democracy. That power is granted to elected officials and appointees under the banner of a party or an independent person to govern the state for the realization of the common development goals of that society. It is therefore implicit that in such an arrangement, the public servant proactively discloses what they are doing with the resources of the people, what they are doing to improve their welfare. If that information is proactively disclosed, the public officer and the office should be enthusiastic about it. They should be enthusiastic about proactively disclosing information. I have been fortunate to work closely with some distinguished public servants. I call them Ghanaian heroes. In my last 16 years, like Professor Mirinda Greenstreet, 
the late justice retired VCRAC crap, Mr. Kofi Kwansin, who is still alive, Mr. Daniel Demlevo, and many others. These qualities that I've talked about were present, ever present in all of them. From the basic issues of timekeeping to a demand for excellence, integrity, and accountability. So I'm saying the vehicle is public service, integrity, and accountability. But what is the condition of that vehicle? Is it a 10-year-old trotter or a 2021 V8 with all the, the trimmings? Certainly, I think probably most of you know the answer to that question. The Ibrahim Index of Africa Governance is a tool that measures and, and monitors governance performance in African countries. It is produced by the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, which began uh, in 2007. Now, Ghana has generally performed well on the Ibrahim Index compared to many African countries. And that is to be expected. But the story is not encouraging in recent times. And the 2020 report, for me, is a bit worrying. Our ranking has generally been dropping. Uh, in the Ibrahim Index, often we are part of the top five, top six. But now we seem to have stayed at eight. And we hope that uh, we won't decline any further. What is worrying is that we are dropping or stagnating in some indices that are fundamental to the conversations we are having today about public service integrity and accountability. If you look at the rule of law and justice indicators, including executive compliance with rule of law, the impartiality of judicial systems, equality before the law, law enforcement, property rights, we have dropped in ranking from a high of second in Africa between 2010 and 2017 to eighth in 2019. It's also reflected in the ranking in the accountability and transparency indicator score. That is looking at checks and balances, undue influence on government officials, access to information. We were ranked fourth from the last, I think we were ranked third in the last three years. Now we are fourth. Then if you look at public education indicator, public administration indicators, which are critical for the public service, it's, it shows us that we have made progress, at least in terms of our ranking from 11th in 2017 to 5th in 2019. However, there's a catch. The report knows that as many as 32 countries deteriorated, and a look at our actual score actually reflects that we have benefited from a lot of people not actually showing any progress during this period. So if you look at our score, we had a high of 63 in 2016. We dipped into the 50s. And then in 2016, we came back to 20, uh, 62. Really, for me, it's a, a story of stagnation. Similarly, if you draw on popular perceptions of official corruption or levels of trust of institutions, the story is not encouraging. The last Afrobarometer survey, Round 8, released in 2019, basically concludes that in the eyes of the public, the key servants of the people elected and appointed are corrupt. Everybody is hitting 70%, 80%, and so on and so forth. Key institutions are also perceived to be corrupt. Now, this generally then feeds into the low levels of trust in state institutions as well. And of course, we are all citizens. We interact with the state. So you can, you can tell whether or not this is an exaggeration from, from, from the majority of citizens or it, it represents the reality. One other piece of evidence which I want to share with you is to look at the annual ritual with the Auditor General's report, ref which reflects a public sector that has extremely weak accountability. 
the annual report show consistent mismanagement and abuse of public funds over the years. It shows that six different types of financial irregularities continue to plague the nation's finances. Uh, my Pescoba brother, Chachu, is here. He's an accountant, so he knows a lot of uh, what I'm talking about. These are cash irregularities, payroll irregularities, procurement irregularities, tax irregularities, and 15,000 in 2016. In 2020, it's 1 billion 802 million. Payroll irregularities was 409,000. In 2020, it's 9 million. Payroll irregularities, 91,000. Now it's 846. And it goes on. Similar ob observations were made by the Auditor General in the report of the Auditor General on public accounts pre-university educational institutions for the year and 2019. And the Auditor General says the trend shows that in all areas there's been an increase in the quantum over the 2018 figure, signifying laxity by school heads to implement audit recommendations and enforce regulations. So this is to our headmaster. If, if we are not enforcing audit committee reports, we have to, because it's not showing us in a good light. We want to make sure that the resources that the public provides is able to uplift the dignity of mankind. And it's these small things that makes the difference. Pescoba students, ladies and gentlemen, the vehicle that we seek to use to promote and protect the dignity of mankind is not in a good condition. But at the same time, the challenges are many. But we cannot abandon the public service or the state. For me, it is not a choice. If as Pescoba and as citizens, we have been sleeping on our charge, this is the time to wake up from our slumber and take action. All of us in our small and in our big ways will have to contribute. Let me conclude. Who will protect the state? Who will protect the public service? So that it would uphold the dignity of man. The protection of the state is as much our charge as Pescoba, as citizens, and also as citizens. What can we do? What should we do? I want to share two broad strategies and two specific proposals for Pescoba Global. First strategy. Often when you are confronted with such overwhelming challenges, I always say that you have to adopt the flood management strategy. When a house is flooding, there is the instinct to rush, find a bucket, to try to scoop the water out. But the first challenge is to try to stop the water getting in. To give you that breathing space to scoop the water out. That's why when a ship is sinking, the first thing is to deal with the leakage. And then you can find time to scoop the water out. So we have to plug the leak. The issue looks overwhelming. There's so many things to do at the same time, and it's very difficult. How do you start? But where are the areas that we have to deal with substantively to begin to plug the leak and stop the bleeding? That is the way we have to look at the challenge. And that starts all the way from political parties. If the political parties don't believe in the protection of the state and they see the state as a means to an end for their private benefit, 
then we will never be able to uphold the dignity of man. But in a multi-party democracy, you cannot do it without political parties. So we need political parties with the orientation. They will be the protectors of the state. They will make sure the public service works so that it can benefit all of us. You need government that is oriented to protecting the state. You need a bureaucracy that is oriented towards protecting the state. Finding that core orientation is what we have to focus on. Who is going to protect the state in all these elements? Citizens. Who are the citizens that will protect the state? A related layer of that is that we then need to build a network of people, of like-minded people, who understand this imperative of the public service. That they know without the public service, we cannot talk about achieving our goals as a society. At some point, even if we think that things are fine now, we will retrogress. And, and many, many, many countries, countries have gone down that road. So we need that critical mass of protectors of the state. And we need to begin to mobilize them. And I think I see many here, Pescoba here, who can be part of that core critical mass. Second strategy. This is about fighting corruption. For me, I, and I say this every opportunity I get, that corruption is an existential threat to our democracy and to our society. Any time that we think that we can't do anything about it, we should, we should abandon it, then we have accepted our doom. So there is no other way but corruption has to be fought. Because if corruption becomes the norm, many of us will not live in this society and will not even survive in it. So here, my, my executive director, Professor Prempe, uh, developed uh, an equation. He calls it uh, C equals M multiplied by O divided by S. Where M is motive, O is opportunity, S is the probability and the severity of sanctions. And the basic premise is that corruption will not thrive if you don't have motive and opportunity. You can dream about corruption all you want. If the opportunity is not there, corruption will not happen. But if you have corruption and you have opportunity, you might consider the probability that you get caught and that when you get caught, you will be sanctioned so heavily and therefore you might not engage in corruption. So if you want a strategy that you want to confront corruption, you have to work at all these layers. Now, motivation is very hard to fight. There's not much you can do about motivation apart from some public education, some moralizing, encouragement, some societal, you know, um, uh, sanctions, cultural, and so on. But there's a lot you can do about opportunity. There's a lot you can do about discretion. There's a lot you can do about regulation. There's a lot you can do about checking behavior. And of course, there's a lot you can do about the probability and the severity of sanctions. So if we were to spend our resources, it has to be in reducing opportunity. By setting in the equation, you want to reduce motivation, reduce opportunity. But if you had to choose, 
where you spend the most so that people can dream and dream about people can dream and dream about uh, corruption but they will never get the opportunity to be corrupt and of course that would some that's a, uh, an outcome that we would all cherish on the proposal when I was and I read about the story of St. Peter's uh, just from the website and I'm not I don't even I'm not even sure how many of our students have actually gone and read the website and the story but this is a story that overwhelms me and even maybe at that time for those who were doing it this was something that came to them easily but when you think about it there are many ways you can use a 300 acre <laughs> land <laughs> right but to build a school and have that vision and see what has come out of it and this founders day for me is a dedication to all those who who did that but i think we need even more than that that community of actors who sacrifice we should have a statue some memento something that the students would continue it will be a symbol that when they are in school they understand what these people did and it's something i'm charging pesco back global that we should do and then also i think that for me reading our story i have no doubt in my mind that my passion for public interest and what has i have become comes from my journey through St. Peter's and the foundations that were built that we stand on now. And I think that if we were to make a contribution to Ghana and to, and to promoting integrity in the public service, we have to institute some recognition for Pescoba who are serving the public. But not just PESCO, but others that we recognize who reflect our values. So that this is our commitment. Because it's our charge, we adopt the state. We become protectors of the state. So those two things, I believe, will go a long way in helping us advance our charge in pursuit of dignitati homino. May God bless all Pescoba, and may God bless us all. I thank you for your attention. Brilliant. Brilliant. Wow, 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 wow. Doctor has spoken. A few words I picked up, if you like, a few phrases. It says, To serve others is to deny yourself. Again, to serve others is to deny yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, once more, let's give it up to Dr. Kojo Asante. That was indeed a powerful one. At this point, um, questions, questions, if you have any questions, uh, let's take them so that the speaker and the chairman can address them. Uh, you just raise your hand, I can bring the mic over to you. So anyone with a question, you just raise your hand. You have. Very good. Any other? Any other person? Okay, so let's, let's hear your question. I'm sorry. Okay. So, my, my I don't know whether it's a question. <laughs> it is it's not, not actually a question. question. Um, I'm, I'm also, also thinking, thinking that... that like the analogy you give that if there is a flooding in your house, what do you do? Uh, what about also putting up systems to make it difficult for people to think about corruption in the first place? Because I believe that if the, the systems of the state is such that it does not allow corruption to be committed easily, it will also go a long way to help us. Then secondly, the, the values our, our mindset, mindset as, 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 as people, people because, because we can, can see some, some countries, countries where the level of corruption, corruption 
it's, it's quite, quite low, low because, because it, it may have permeated from their upbringing and societal values and the like. So how do all, all these also play in this equation of the dignity of women? Because human beings, when we live as on our own, we might be tempted to fear of the natural cause of doing new things. Thank you. Okay, okay, so. So, so I, my, my question, question is uh, about, about politicization of the public service. service. So, so I, I worked work in the public service, service and at that, that time, time, years ago, I had fears that we were rapidly politicizing the public service to the point of ineffectiveness. Because every four years or eight years, we sweep off the leadership for because they have become so politicized that a new administration does not want to work with them. And we don't create seasoned public services at the same rapid pace. Those people can take 15, 20, 30 years to reach that state. So I don't know what your observation is and how we can um, cure that. Uh, yeah. Okay, and there, yes, there's another hand there. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for this illuminating uh, lecture. Very, very impressive. I just want you to comment on just something very little. The influence of culture on corruption. The concept of gentuahene. Thank you. Okay. So I believe the, the chairman and the speaker will address those questions. Okay. Actually, um, I'll start with the last question, the last comment or observation. The, that is one of the challenges we have, culture versus corruption. People still struggle to understand or appreciate or accept the concept of conflict of interest. The idea that when you are given power and authority, you can use it to benefit your family, your friends, your tribe, actually it is anathema to your culture. But every corruption case that I have come across starts with conflict of interest, starts with nepotism. So it goes back to our set of values that there are obviously clashes with some of our belief and the state that we are trying to create. Because certainly, if everybody can use public power and public resources for their private benefit, then all we have to do is to capture the state and then we use it for whatever we want. And of course, that would deny many others. And it would be unfair because why should I pay taxes so that you will use uh, uh, get fund money or you use um, uh, uh, what's the cocoa board um, a scholarship to go and educate your your children in, um, in some abroad schools in abroad, and then I have to go to University of Ghana or UCC, even though UCC these days is doing very well. So I mean that 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 is the unfairness of of what we are we are saying when we insist that. It is crazy for you to get the opportunity and you don't want to help your brother. But that conversation we have to have. Because it's obvious that people, people just are not prepared to accept that. And I feel sorry for a lot of public officers. The pressure that is put on you and what they will say about you in your village. This person is wicked. Look at what others are doing. Right? And he doesn't want to give his, his, uh, his brother an opportunity. So there is a, a cultural clash. The value systems that underpin any democratic process, democratic governance process, we are not prepared to subject ourselves to it because we believe it is opposite to our culture. But we cannot eat our cake and have it. So 
it is a conversation for me is, i think it's an important conversation that we should have politicization of the public service it's i think it's it's gotten so bad for me what it has done is it's cowed public servants you go to a meeting of a minister nobody speaks if the minister doesn't say speak <laughs> nobody says a word even if the minister is open and wants everybody to contribute nobody will say a word why maybe you might say something that is not pleasant the next time you get transferred to a place that maybe you are not prepared for or you get demoted or your somebody sits on your appointment these things are going on on a daily basis so after a while if you are in a public service you advise yourself and you stay quiet and then when you see all the things that go along people say ah, but why didn't anybody check this well, you don't you will not you will not go and open your mouth just in case something happens so the politicization is, is killing our public I, I think public service I mean it's it's on life support at this point it's on life support and that is why I talk about who would protect the state and it's starting from even the parties who in the parties believe that they have to protect this state for the welfare of the people that's where we have to so who in government is to protect the state to make sure that public servants have um the response they have the room to be able to do their jobs values teaching children i always say children five years three years they mimic everything they see so you can teach a child that you should not steal you should not do this you should not do that if they live in a society where everybody's stealing, it comes to nothing. When we were growing up, we said, work hard. You have to dedicate yourself. You have to be truthful. You have to be this. You, you saw people, you met your friends of your fathers that did all of those things. The more corruption becomes pervasive to the point that every junction, a, a, a policeman is taking this and that. There is no way you are going to persuade that child. I mean, we have students who are watching. People think they don't know what is going on. They know. So you are, you are in the house, you are teaching them all these values. And then when they are in, 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 in the society, it's completely opposite. They would adjust their own orientation. And that is what we have to attack. Because otherwise, people will say, oh, put it in books and all of that. It will come to nothing. If society itself shows uh, a different set of values just the question about putting in systems is that's what i was talking about opportunities you have to tackle the opportunities so that even if you have the motivation if there's no opportunity you will not be able to be corrupt so that that's that's part of the equation that we have to work on maybe i'll just sit here <laughs> if there's any um i guess that will be it Okay, let's take the last one and then we wrap it up. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman and then uh, Dr. Asante for this uh, brilliant lecture. Um, I think as a country, we also have to sit down and ask ourselves why are people so corrupt? Let us not just look at the, the high level people, i.e., people in the positions, the political positions, and all that. The question which we must ask ourselves difficult questions like, have we really aligned our cost of living to our salary structure? If you want to rent a place, you are being told to pay one year or two years advance. Let us be realistic and true with ourselves that with, your, with a public servant salary, can he afford? My takeaway from your lectures is that 
Let us not create opportunity for what? Corruption. A public servant who has got children, on the average two or three, you expect him to go and pay two years advance, pay for his children's school fees, give them three million squares a day. Come on, let's ask ourselves. Let's do the mass. Is that realistic? So these are the, some, of, some of the things that we should be looking at and talking about. And they are, I mean, in, in uh, developed countries, you go there and even the one who is not working is being given a place to sleep and food to eat. And therefore, at least corruption towards minimalism. 